When we're making music, we want our audiences to inhabit the sounds we make. We want them to feel like our songs are surrounding them and that they're being taken into new worlds of sound. My guest on the Music Production Podcast today is Ross Lara. He's a music producer and film composer who specializes in creating worlds with his music. Ross combines his love of nature and adventure with his music production, and he's gone deep into immersive audio with Dobly Atmos. Ross shares exactly what Dobly Atmos is and how it's affected his music. And he also talks about how his initial success wasn't quite as satisfying and fulfilling as he had hoped, and how he now uses his four F's criteria to determine if a project is for him. In Ableton Live 11.3, there's a new synthesizer called Drift. And Drift is meant to be extremely expressive and to capture the inconsistencies and warmth of real analog hardware synthesizers. And if you've paid any attention to the sound design work I've done in my hundreds of Ableton Live packs over the last few years, then you can probably guess that I love Drift. I've been designing my own presets for Drift for the last couple weeks, and it's incredible. Right now you're hearing me improvise on some of those presets I made with Drift. I've got a free pack of 10 presets that you can have for your music over at brianfunk.com slash drift. It even includes a 16 pad drum rack where each drum sound is made up of a drift preset. But I actually made 50 different presets and all 50 of those presets are only available to members of my music production club because you guys are my biggest supporters. Members of the music production club always get my newest creation as soon as it's released. My educational materials, including video courses, my books, helpful PDFs, and they're part of a really cool, supportive community of fellow music makers. I love that community. We have a Discord server where I get to hear people's music. We get together and hang out for live Zoom meetings share our music, share tips, do projects together. It's so much fun and really exciting and inspiring for me to share this community with everybody. And there's also bonus materials for the Music Production Club, which are basically just free stuff from my store that I put on there every once in a while. So if you want to get all 50 of these Drift presets, sign up for the Music Production Club at brianfunk.com slash mpc. I'm really proud of these presets. They're so expressive and deep. And some of them have maybe a reverb or a delay on them or maybe an arpeggiator, but almost all of them are just drift itself without any effects. It's amazing what you can do with this synthesizer. And I had a lot of fun making these sounds. And I think they're gonna work really nicely in all kinds of different music genres. So if you wanna get your hands on 10 free drift presets, go to brianfunk.com drift. If you want all 50, join the club brianfunk.com slash mpc. Thanks a lot and enjoy this episode of the Music Production Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. On today's show, I have Ross Lara and he is the CEO of Archipelago Entertainment, which is a studio and a whole company really, but the studio is on top of the world in Breckenridge, Colorado on a mountain. Um, Doing, I think that's the highest altitude Dobly Atmos system in the world. So on top of the world, making us immersive music. And um, he's doing a lot of cool work. And I, what I think is really fun about what you're doing, Ross, is that you've got this like kind of connection with nature that's going on. That's really like deep into the whole philosophy of what you do. And with immersive audio, that really makes sense to have that. So I'm excited to learn a lot more about immersive audio, Dobly Atmos, or I think I'm always saying that wrong. Um, do Dobly, <laughs> but whatever. Dobly. So you're, um, you're nailing it. Okay, cool. I've always confused the L and the B, but hey, man, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me, Brian. It's a it's a real treat, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, me too, man. Um, it's cool that you're doing this thing, um, especially like venturing out into like kind of a new world, really, with the immersive audio. That's kind of um, like a new technology in a way. It's a new level of um, producing and listening to music that's ha we haven't had for a while. We don't get too many advances in the technology. I mean, like stereo was like the mm -hmm. last thing. We, we've had surround sound and stuff, but this is a much more um, accessible thing, I guess, for the average listener. Um, there is. 
is, did you find it? When did you start getting involved in doing that kind of work? Um, well, immersive, immersive audio and Dolby Atmos, primarily that technology has been on my radar for five years, um, perhaps. I mean, I just remember reading it all about in the magazines, wanting to really enjoy that when we w- would go to the movie theaters back in the day. Um, and it was always just this like thing. I was like, man, like, you know, stereo is going to evolve. We have all of these other technological technology advancements happening all around us from cars. I mean, everything, it's just, everything is evolving at such a rapid pace. And I thought, you know, gosh, this thing called Dolby Atmos and immersive is really something else. And it's just, just like everything that, that I had just prior uh, mentioned prior, you know, stereo has been around for decades, you know, since the, what was it? The forties or the fifties, the I should say or the 60s um but yeah so point being decades and i was like you know this is this is evolving and sound is evolving and like imagine the stories that we can tell um in addition to just chords and and melody and songwriting how we can help augment the story with the mix and the production and the programming of everything in immersive and it's uh, that that passion and that interest really stuck with me for many years and then I re- I can recall when Apple announced their their introduction of spatial audio into their catalog. I remember calling my partner Brian. And I just said, "Hey, man, like I think we got some trailblazers out there. I think it's time for us to make the investment." And I, I was just itching also for some of you know evolving in my production process too you know when you've been doing this for a long time you are always looking for those new ways to keep things fresh and to just discover new ideas and this was just a natural intersection of that time in life that time in producing music and then also starting to see from that business standpoint there could be an roi there could be there's now going to be some desire and uh some wishes for from clients to do stuff in immersive so uh it was last may it's let's see we're in uh june 2023 right now so it was may of 2022 we built out the studio or just i should probably rephrase that we just installed dolby atmos in the current studio that i work in and uh yeah it's been it's been amazing it, there there's definitely some some good old growing pains with anything but i tell you what man i have so many little moments of like holy cow i'm thinking of this music differently i'm thinking of the yeah. production and the writing process differently as like it's just different than the way it has been for the past 20 years and that is really really exciting mm. yeah i guess it's been about probably two years since apple kind of yeah. did that with, and also the high res audio yeah mm-hmm. and um the tools are starting to become available to producers as well oh yeah and i'm smart to get in on it you know early like that well it's and to to that to that last point you mentioned that the tools are becoming more accessible and they're around for all of the all of us content creators and musicians producers to use when we started doing our initial research we it was in that time frame where it we were pretty convinced that we were going to need a second computer to run the dolby atmos render and have all that that additional hardware but even during that six month period of researching and deciding what equipment we were going to get, we discovered that, wow, we're just going to be able to use one computer, the, the Mac Pro that we have, and the renderer can run on that. So just mm-hmm. in that short time frame, the technology got faster, better, more affordable, just in that short time frame. And I, I just I trust that a year from now, some of the hardware that we had purchased a year and a half ago, a year ago is going to be obsolete or things are going to come out that are going to be a fraction of the price at a higher quality. So it's happening at a rapid rate. Yeah. Well, Apple just did their big conference where they announced the new gear. They got the VR helmet that you can get, <laughs> but the, the Mac yeah, Pro was another one that, 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 that was got, wild. Yeah. Yeah, those, well, that that kind of like augmented reality, virtual reality, that must play right into this, I would imagine. Yeah, um, absolutely. We haven't dealt with too much of that, um, where clients or companies or whomever we're working with, they haven't said, "Hey, we have an augmented or virtual reality world. Can you create immersive audio, or can you produce a score, produce music with an immersive audio deliverable of any kind?" We haven't had that happen yet. But I imagine it's right around the corner, um, especially 
meta, you know, and their metaverse ideas and what Apple is now doing. Um, I trust that it's probably around the corner, but I, you know, I have mixed feelings on like throwing on a pair of goggles and like separating yourself from, you know, what's actually happening right here and now, you know, in real life. Yeah. So, but I, I just think it's, it's pretty wild. All the things that are happening right now, the technology. It is. I mean, it's been like five years or so since I put on a PlayStation virtual reality headset mm -hmm. and was really blown away with just the way the audio tracks with when you turn your head and yeah. it was so immersive. And the most shocking part of it is when I took the headset off and I was just still in my friend's bedroom. I was like, wow, wow. I, re yeah. I really went somewhere and I, I was just sitting here the whole Holy time. Holy <laughs> moly. Yeah, it's so, it's coming, man. It's, it's here, it's happening. And you know, just like with anything, as the consumer at the end of the day is able to experience what we're experiencing in these awesome rooms and how the developers and producers and directors are cultivating these stories and how they're being told and what mediums. Um, mm. as, you know, as long as the consumer at the end of the day, someone like my 18 year old nephew is able to enjoy it that way, right. like that's then it's just going to be off the races and all of the stuff is going to keep getting better and better. And hopefully, yeah. you know, the price tags don't hopefully go up too much, but uh -huh. it'd be great for, you know, gamers, viewers of movies, fans of music, things like that. Probably like most things, it starts out a little pricey at first. Absolutely, yeah. And like like a flat screen TV was so expensive when they first came out. Now they're like, you can get them so cheap, it's crazy. Yeah, so. absolutely. Good point. Um, I wanted to maybe ask you to just kind of tell the story of the company, you know, and uh, how how this all came together. Um, it sounds like a pretty interesting experience you had, kind of like almost like an aha moment. And um, it's really informed a lot of the work you've done ever since. And I think those types of things are, are really important to define us all as like artists and musicians. These moments every once in a while, something... If you're lucky and you notice it, you can kind of say, like, ah, that's where I want to go. And it seems like you have a pretty clear direction. Yeah, uh, great way to lay that out there, Brian. And I think that's, uh, I think all of us who, all of us who walk the planet um, are on our journey to find some of those things that inspire us and move us and get us stoked every day. Um, I had an epiphany back in the day, as you had inferred, it was about 10 years ago, I was living in Atlanta and I was starting to hit the milestones in my music career of what society would tell you is successful and awesome. And like, oh, you're making it quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, and that was number one records in several countries. And just like some of those type of placements and syncs that I was getting were really taking off in music and pop music primarily. But I recall when those uh, quote unquote, you know, things or milestones were un unfolding, I just wasn't feeling fulfilled. And I was questioning like, man, here we are thinking like, I thought this was going to, you know, make me really excited, but I really wasn't. And I remember sitting there at a bench in a park in Georgia and just thinking, I, I want something more. I, I need uh, to continue to be on this path that, uh, I can find a, a really meaningful, like fulfilling place in my heart with my music. And don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed making all of that music. I've enjoyed making every piece of music that I've done over all of these years, but it's, it was that why and that vision that was just lacking a little bit in the pop world. I was uh, chasing placements and some of them were being very successful, but the overall journey of that was just fitting into a formula, fitting into that whole thing that record labels want and so forth. And also like the record labels and the sync houses and so forth controlled the destiny of the music. You know, you had to not only impress them, but then eventually they had to be convinced that like a million teenagers are going to like the music and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I was just like, man, I just, I need to find something else. It was a trip with my family to the Galapagos Islands that was life-changing for me. And I remember sitting next to the sea lions like feet away from them swimming with hammerhead sharks just the freaking milky way and the band of stars that were 
out there um, when I was out on the ocean at night just like totally moved me and it channeled the other side of me outside of my music. I've always been a thrill seeker, an adventurer, um, an athlete of many sports. I played football and all that growing up. I was on the ski team in the winter up here in Copper Mountain, Colorado and snowmobiled and just lived for adventure. And I remember that was the light bulb moment of, oh, I, I would like to bridge the gap between music and adventure and use cutting edge technology to do that. And that's going to be my musical mission uh, with the company, Archipelago Entertainment. And hence, being in the Galapagos Islands, that is a group of islands. That is the definition of an archipelago. So I called my buddy Brian. He was working up in the corporate world in Washington, D.C. We were both like 24, 25 at the time, something like that. And I said, hey, man, you want to uh, leave your corporate job where you're making lots of good money and come on down here to Atlanta and we'll pay ourselves nothing and build a company and build a, something from the ground up. And he said, let me put in my two week notice. I'm coming down. And <laughs> I, it was something like that. And it was me. He was down there a month later and we lived in a 450 square foot apartment together above a garage um, in Grant Park, Atlanta. And we started Archipelago Entertainment. And I tell you, it's been one heck of a journey. We've learned a lot of really great lessons and had a lot of really good times. And it, I feel like we're just beginning. And it's mm. it's evolved a lot too over the years. We started off as a record label, artist development, music education, music services, music services being, yep, we're writing for labels and artists and producing artists, things like that, um, doing all the K-pop stuff still that I was involved in. So we were spread pretty thin. And that was also one of the most valuable lessons early on in the company was, okay. And, and it's funny how I meant, I just rambled off that list of things that we're doing. And of course, trying to get those partnerships to do the adventure and music together. So all of those things were happening at once and we just we learned with time like hey we really got to hone in our vision and that was just at the end of the day it's making music and we're on the infinite pursuit to do a plethora of different projects when it comes to film and video games and so forth and then anytime we get a chance to bridge that world of adventure and music together we do that and that's led to um, amazing relationships with companies like red bull over the years that we've done a plethora of exciting and, and really neat projects with them that allow us to do that very vision that we had, you know, 10 years ago. So that's, that's that. Mm, that. That sounds like something in line with Red Bull. It's a whole kind of, yeah, uh, they were the dream too. client and, and yeah. we're very, very lucky that we get to work with them to this day. Um, we, mm. I used to cold call, you know, cold email Red Bull all the time back in college and, it's fun to look back on some of those emails that I had some people trying to help make introductions here and there, but it wasn't until 2018, we had a gracious introduction to the right people and the rest is history from there. Mm. Well, we should probably get back to that. I wanted to ask you though, um, you know, what that was like at that moment where, like, I think we kind of joked maybe a little bit before we started recording about like, getting into a career of music, like, oh, what are you doing that for kind of thing, you know? Almost like, I don't know. I don't know if my parents felt like this, but probably when they saw me pick up a guitar, they're like, uh-oh, <laughs> you know? This, this is, maybe we don't want them going down that path, I don't know. But um, well, they were very supportive though. So That's I great. should say that. Oh, you're but, very appreciative. But um, that feeling though, when you've, you're achieving the success, like, by all marks, like that's kind of the dream come true. Like if you're making money, you're, you're scoring like successful things, successful projects. Um, how was it like this kind of a, uh Oh feeling like, cause this is, um, something like we always have like these dreams, right. And sometimes you get to these points and you realize like, Oh, this is not how I imagined it. This is, doesn't yeah, feel the way I it's mean, supposed to feel. Brian, this is a wonderful conversation that you and I could have dinner and share a couple of bottle, bottles of wine over and like we'd still be talking about it. Like this is a <laughs> bigger moment. This is a bigger lesson. And these are, this is bigger things than just music. This is just an individual like any one of us chasing 
what makes us whole and what is fulfilling and what brings joy and happiness and hard work and then reward for that hard work. But like having a, a just cause or a vision or something like that, a goal at the end of the day that like is, that's just really important to you and that it's so big that you'll just do everything you can for as long as it takes or really a lifetime to like accomplish those things. And that was, I just lacked some of that vision that mm. I thought I had at that younger age, but I really didn't. Um, my goals back in the day, Brian, were uh, winning a Grammy and things like that. And I just, I just realized in my early to mid twenties that that just wasn't, it wasn't going to be my priority moving forward. And I realized that for me, for this may not, this probably doesn't apply to, to others, and that's totally great. But just for me and my journey, I was like, you know, I'd, I'd rather. I'd rather do this whole like score a Nat Geo film like that. I can go out onto location with the filmmakers and record amazing sounds and uh, electronically treat those sounds to accompany the orchestra and all of the cool production that I'm doing later. And like really just have the musical DNA of that location in the score that became mm -hmm. like my big goal. And that to me to this day, is like what really gets me excited the most and i just like i just didn't really get into all the fluff um and i just i was you know i've had moments of that especially earlier on in my career where it was about those la rooftop parties it was about chasing those grammys and number one records and things like that and i enjoyed a lot of those times but still you go i, I went to bed just thinking there's something more out there and uh just my thirst for adventure when I'm not making music is so profound for me that that just became just the, the natural answer of the marriage of those two industries of adventure and music was just going to be my thing. And that's, um, I've kept really true to that for the past 10 years. And I, and I don't see that, you know, changing in a way. I mean, I'm sure it, things will change in music and life evolves and our priorities may shift down the road. But nowadays, um, I think, gosh, you know, I my reward is a big powder day when there's two and a half feet of fresh snow and I can go skiing or snowmobiling and then come home and make music and spend time with family. Mm -hmm. That to me is my that's a that's a that's the greatest day that I'll have. All right. Uh, yeah, that's, cool. that, that's what I'm chasing is that that freedom and that flexibility and always just trying to become more efficient and productive in the studio so I can have some of that time to go out and, and do those things and then just happen to make music out there too. So, mm. yeah. You know, as we're coming up on like the summer season here in New York, it's getting nice out and mm -hmm. beaches are open and everything. And I also have a lot more, I'll have a lot more free time being off from work. And I think like, yeah, I want to make all this music, but um, sometimes the music making process is very much like holed up in a studio. It's very opposite of like some of this adventure stuff you're talking mm -hmm. about, the getting out in the mountains, snowmobiling. You're kind of, and I, I often struggle with that where I'm inside and it's like, it's so nice out. I kind of want to be outside. And then I get outside and I'm like, oh, but I want to make music. So I've got these like two pulls and pulling that, bridging that together is just such a smart way to, for you especially to realize that that's where you're going to find the happiness with the marriage of those two things. Um, I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, and, and let's not kid each other. It's, it hasn't always been easy. And there have also been plenty of seasons in this, uh, this 10 year ride so far with archipelago that there's a year or two where, the project we're not being we're not in the middle of a project that we get to do adventure and music and technology together we're scoring a video game that has nothing to do with that or we're doing documentaries or short films or i'm co-writing with other composers or whatever that may be um so there are seasons but it's all about for us you know it's the infinite game and it's like we're just on that endless pursuit of doing it and um when you when we look back now it's like oh we've had it had the opportunity to do a lot of really neat things with folks like Red Bull and a handful of other um, great brands and companies and artists to be able to do this. And uh, we're on the verge of potentially doing something that could be the biggest project 
to date for us. And the, and, and its main thing is adventure and music. Mm. So fingers crossed, we're uh, a, a bit of a ways out from really having that green light, but it's just really neat. Even just the potential and the conversations that we're in with this entity is like, it's, it's really exciting. So it's just, you just got to keep going, right? Just got to keep going. Yeah. And I think having those values in advance, knowing what you're looking for, I'm sure this probably includes a lot of saying no to things that don't vibe with that, where you sort of realize like, I'm, I'm trying to get to this place mm -hmm. and so this project is either getting me closer or not. It's, it's taking me one way or the other. Yeah. Sometimes we have to do that. I think all of us, sometimes we need to know when to say no and have a, a little mental checkbox list of, okay, is this going to, you know, be fun? Is it going to be, um, is it, is it going to benefit the future of the company? Is it fruitful? Those type of things. We have this, this, uh, little thing with archipelago called the four F's and it's like fun, future, family, um, financial. So mm. the, like the family cool. F is like, oh, is this like a family friend or is this like a really close peer colleague that, um, will help, you know, drive the decision-making process? Is it going to be fun? Super important. Not always the case. But is it that? But that's really important. Um, financial is this going to you know pay well? Is it going to be fruitful for all of us and worth the time? And then uh, I said family, fun, future, future. Yeah, yeah, future. And is this all part of the greater plan? And mm -hmm. if we can get at least two of those Fs for each and every project, um, it's greenlit. And right. gosh, you know, especially and also when you're in startup mode, when there's really no cash, there's not a lot of cash flow and things like that. You're obviously saying yes to everything. Yeah. Uh, but it's just been in the past few years where we've been able to really digest um, certain offers and projects and so forth, and said, you know, what this this may or may not work but we do try to find a way to make it work whether that's extending our team bringing on more people and i might be a bit more hands-off so we can focus on other stuff but our team is working on stuff so it really just depends but you never know when um, the faucet is going to be turned off so we always try mm. to find a way to make anything work mm. well having that criteria is great because yeah. these decisions are tough and um i've found myself involved in work that it just wasn't meaningful to me and i started to realize that that um it wasn't taking me where i want to go and um having a just sort of like without thinking kind of, i don't have like the four f's or anything though i like that a lot but having just this like hey if it meets these particular things or if it doesn't meet these things it, so you don't have to think about it every time I, I also yeah. ask myself, like, would I want to do this tomorrow? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. sometimes, oh yeah, that'd be kind of a cool opportunity and it's two months away and it feels like it's never going to get there. So you're like, okay. But if it's yeah. tomorrow and I go, oh, I don't want to do that. Then I know that like, well, no yeah, that's, that's a great question to ask yourself. Um, you know, you're touching on time and time is all we have. Yeah. That's the one thing that we all have in common and we all have limited time it seems and each day is ticking so yeah that's to go down that deeper philo philosophical rabbit hole that's becoming that be resonates more and more with me as the days and weeks months and the years go by mm. is, is this a good use of time because yeah you don't it's know finite. We're, not gonna get, we're not gonna get that back yeah it's finite and there's no like meter you know it's not like your gas tank where you see i still got half a tank left <laughs> like yeah well, you could be on e right now for all we know it's um hope so it's not. really important yes. to, yeah i hope not too <laughs> yeah. but that's it's an important thing to think about for sure absolutely so um what was the uh work with red bull so uh, how do, how does that happen um what was that like for you guys when that finally came through um, we've done a, a plethora of different projects with Red Bull over the years. Um, we started off making uh, library music for them. So they have Sounds of Red Bull, and it's a fantastic platform for mm. filmmakers and content creators to get great music into their films and into their videos. And we started off doing that. And 
we we kind of when we were talking to our guys at Red Bull, we were like, yeah, you know, like we'll do whatever it takes to show you guys. You know, you have to gain your trust, gain their their trust. Um, so we were like, yep, let's we're we're gonna do anything. So we were given those projects to start doing back in the day, and then as those were wrapping up, um, there were more opportunities that came about. And I can't dive into all of them, but I mean, everything. There's been stuff with AI. There's been branding efforts between um, world recognizable car brands um, that we've been able to work on. We've done commercials, like music for commercials. Uh, one of the a really cool project that we got to do is their flagship um, mountain biking event called Red Bull Rampage. Happens in Virgin, Utah, every year, and the craziest dudes on the face of the planet that <laughs> i mean they are just i don't know if you've ever seen any of those clips have you seen any of those clips from rebel rampage brian is this like a kind of bmx like crazy extreme i mean uh, they, yeah they, and... it, they're they're literally sending like 80 foot cliffs in utah mm. and they're doing a backflip off the cliff and then landing it's insane <laughs> um so that is their big big event for north america and we uh, we were brought on to do the soundtrack for that event. So I got to go to Red Bull or to Virgin, Utah, had all access to be able to record all of these sounds. I mean, everything from riders like landing after sticking a 40 foot canyon gap jump to sitting right next to the mechanics in their trucks, uh, tweaking and adjusting the bikes. So the riders had the best capable bike to go down that hill. Um, I got all of these sounds over the course of two days and then was able to bring bring all of that inspiration and all of those sounds back into the studio. We spent eight, nine months finishing a, a, a let's see, a 10 or 11 piece, yep, a 10 track soundtrack, 10, uh, 10 pieces of music um, formulated the soundtrack. And when you listen to it from start to finish, I mean, it starts off with like the sounds of coffee being poured and that's being like modulated into these like twinkly reverbs and all this type of stuff. And then the, like the third track mechanics of gravity, all the percussion is the, the, the bike sounds and tweaks from the mechanics. And it's like, has this mood and energy of like, yep, these guys are getting ready to go. And then like, by the end of it all, the track called victory, it's just full blown pedal to the metal, tons of energy, the crescendo of the orchestra and the crescendo of the music resolves with um, the crowd roaring and just the, the the prevail of the athlete that just did something borderline mm -hmm. suicidal. He made it to the bottom and his hands in the air. It's just the whole thing. It's just it was awesome. Um, so that was a great project that we got to do with Red Bull. And there's there's some really neat things on the horizon. We've gotten to work with um, specific uh, athletes, their flagship athletes in certain sports. It's just been great. There's been a little bit of everything with them. Mm. I love that way of thinking that you're getting the sounds from the place and putting that in there. I mean, yeah, I, I talk about this so correct. often, like the, when you record, especially into the computer, it's just a sterile environment. If there's nothing playing, it's dead silent. At least on tape, we had a little hiss. There was a little physical something happening in the music. But yeah, um, right. bringing that in, like this, this is really like one of the things I was excited to talk to you about. Just it to me, it's almost like you're making like concept albums in a way. Yes, actually, but, that's a great way to put it. Um, yeah, I, I would agree absolutely. And. Are are you thinking more in terms of like musical elements, atmospheric elements? Or are you trying to, does it turn into like, you know, I, I didn't hear the Red Bull stuff, but does it turn into like rhythms with the bike chain, say, or, the, or is it, it just, yeah, All so it's, it, How, it however, becomes the music? Yeah, I mean, however I can like try to produce it and tweak it, like the first track, uh, Sunrise, I, I had... Uh, mentioned the whole coffee thing and there's just an acoustic guitar like i had a mission i had i had envisioned with that track like those guys are waking up at four in the morning maybe 4 30 the sun's going to be rising in an hour they're getting you know their coffee um brewed and, and ready they're loading up the truck with their bikes to come to the location and so it's a very um it's 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 beautiful it's ambient there are tones and textures that i 
uh, manipulated to accompany, you know, beautiful synths and the acoustic guitar that we had recorded, et cetera, et cetera. And then it kind of crescendos and rises. And then it does hit like this awesome climax where it just sounds like kind of a, an M80, M83, M83 style mm. uh, drop. But all of the percussion is from this big old multi multi gallon water bucket that was at the summit of where the riders drop in on and that bucket just happened to be empty at the time so i put my recorder inside the bucket and just kind of tapped the bucket around and created some amazing gorgeous drum tones um that just were so like hollow and pure and the sine waves in them were just freaking sick um so those like they sound like big tycos but it's freaking water gallon right next to where these guys are dropping in on the run of a lifetime. So just again, it's like that musical DNA is in it. And then, you know, like in addition to the recordings, even if I walked away with only one usable recording, it's just the energy that you feel there. And you're able to, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm able to write a more meaningful score, a more meaningful mm -hmm. like body of music when I can feel everything, I can see the freaking blood coming out of these guys when they wreck. I mean, it's, I mean, the, some guys are dancing with death. There are helicopters, people are being lifted out of with helicopters because when they have an accident, they're falling off of cliffs. It's just absolutely crazy. And you can, you really only can feel that if you're there. Mm -hmm. So some of the tracks, like in the middle of the album, are based around some of the race runs. And they're like two minutes long and that's what the race runs are typically that's the average length of the race of the run for these riders is two minutes and it's just adrenaline it is hard mm. hard music and it's it was, yeah it's fun it was mm. cool yeah right what you know they say so you got to get to know it and be there yeah right? yeah i, I think cool. that stuff even if I think, you know, you could have used like a giant drum to make that sound probably. You probably could have found a sample from right. the comfort of your living room. Yep, absolutely. And it's possible that people listening to it wouldn't know the difference. They're not going to know, but hopefully they feel it. Just but I, I honestly believe that you do feel that. I mean, this is what I love about designing sounds and recording weird things. I might record some strange object somewhere and once I put it in the sampler, it sounds a lot like a Rhodes keyboard. And like some people might say like, well, why wouldn't you yeah. just use the Rhodes? To, but it's like, but it's not. There's something else living in here. There's a, a life going on. And, yes. and so much in music is like little touches here and there that add up. And I really think that stuff mm -hmm. starts to amount to something. And when you're putting all of that energy I think into it. On the head. Yeah, you're hitting the nail on the head, man. That's like, that's everything in music, right? It's even if like, uh, say if you're like recording guitar in your room right there that I can see, but you'd happen to have, I don't know if you have like pets or you have a friend over and they're just out in the background and you can't even see them, but like they're just, there's a little sound and, you know, they whistle or something and then that ends up in the recording. And you never know, like those little artifacts can just be yeah. like gold for a tape loop or something like that. You know, there's so many little things you can do with it and then it just sounds live. Instead of right. what you mentioned a few minutes ago, it's not like a sterile, very dry recording. There's there's that noise in it. Mm. Noise is musical. Yeah, I mean, it's what I love about like a lot of old recordings, Beatles recordings. You yes. hear them talking sometimes. They get on the tracks and they're just there, so they got to keep it. Yep. I had a really like profound moment for me. I was, I don't know, it was like early 2000s. I was recording in a one of the bedrooms in my house and my cat uh was going through my legs you know you know cats are they don't want nothing to do with you until you're actually doing something <laughs> i'm trying to record a classical guitar like so quiet and his little collar is like jingling around and i was about to be like oh, i gotta do that again but i was like wait wait wait, 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 wait. i was like that was kind of cool you know that when you listen to it there's this little jingling going on in this quiet part that just kind of puts you in a place. Mm -hmm. Whereas if that guitar was recorded perfectly in a sound, you know, protected area where only the guitar sound came through, it wouldn't have that life. Mm -hmm. And now all these years later, you know, my cat's long since gone. When I hear that, I'm like, oh yeah. And I'm in that moment, I'm back there. 
Mm-hmm. And I think maybe if someone else would hear it, they wouldn't know it was my cat. But they would know that like life is happening in that music. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 fun to you mentioned like the Beatles and then like uh, I can think of a couple of Michael Jackson records where I hear his foot, you know, tapping yeah. on in the vocal booth. Or he's I just like he, <laughs> he's just kind of like scatting yeah. almost as he's into it. Yep. Like he's dancing. Yep. He's yep. literally you, you, dancing in there. You hear all of that. You can there's this uh <clears throat> I forget the song, but he was like, he must have been like holding the mic stand. And after he resolved and and finished this high belting sustained note, you heard just like his face, like hitting the microphone and it sounded all messed up. And, you know, it was all jangly for just a, you know, half a second, but like, oh, that was him holding the mic. And then like, and it was just, it just, you heard all of the, the rubbing of the, of everything. And it was just like, it was great. Like that just made it so real. Yeah. And then if you don't have any of that, you know, finding ways, there's, there's really great creative ways nowadays is to put in some of this real life noise, like go get some just random recordings or ambient recordings of, you know, a fireplace in your living room. Um, You know, up here, it's really cold in the winter. And my music partner, uh, David from the spaces, we have this little band and he has this great, like, uh, wood burning fireplace and so you know we've recorded that um, several times and we have done that on some of our travels and like if we're gonna write and record and produce a ballad we're just gonna have that for a minute um, crackling of the fireplace negative 25 db in the mix and just like that yeah. right there brings life and just, yeah. it sounds like you're in a snow globe um, just yeah. at a cozy fireplace and it just it, you're right it just brings something to it um so it's it's uh man it's fun making music that way i love it I've, with my band we were doing our album and on one of my one of my missions one of the songs mentions like a seagull and a crab <laughs> so i went crab? out to, to um just around nearby like um north shore long island so just with my little simple recorder, not not a big setup, just a little handheld, like kind of a Roland, kind of like a Zoom sort of deal. Mm-hmm. It was so fun doing that and just trying to capture it just right. Like, all right, where do I want to put the mic to get this like kind of ebb and flow of the sea coming in? You know, just just to get it right and to play around with it, and then drop it in the mix and just hear like how it's the world just opens. Yeah, and and like you're you're um, adding to whatever thematic material you have in the song, Mm -hmm. bringing it to life. And like you said, subtle ways where you could listen to it and not even hear it. But I really do think you feel it. Totally. Listen close enough headphones and you're like, oh yeah. I don't even, I don't even think it's a question anymore. Um, Cause it's, I just, (laughs) people feel it and they, their brain registers things. And sometimes it might take a couple of listens. We I've had some, some notes come in of people saying, Oh, wow. I didn't hear that on the first listen or two, but then I heard on the third, it was like, Oh, it's, you know, great. So yeah. Yeah. It will come around. And like, you know, video games have the term replay value, you know, mm-hmm. like game, is it worth playing again? And I think that's in music too. It's like replay value where you might listen to it again. Like, yeah. What was that? What was going on there? You know, yeah. something kind of cool happens at this point. Absolutely. Totally. So let me ask you a little about um, just some of the technical stuff with Atmos and um, Immersive. Because this, again, like, what that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about beca- making our music more immersive and making taking the listener on a journey, giving them a world to sort of exist in. And with all this new dimension that you can play around with, I mean, stereo is even fun. Like, I, I often like to mix in mono just to get everything right. And then, because the satisfaction of hitting the stereo button or, or turning mono off, and then just like, oh, I have all this room to put stuff. Um, I mean, forget it. It's like so many more dimensions when you're talking about uh, Atmos. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm guess I have maybe just. Maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to kind of just define it a little bit if there's anyone unsure of what we're talking about. I mean, I have really only a passing knowledge of what's going on anyway. So 
Um, and then maybe some of the gear you're using, some of the what software even or any of that stuff. Yeah, really. you know, um, I'll, I'll give a nutshell definition <clears throat> of it. And uh, for you and anybody else out there, I mean, there's tons of information out there on it now. But uh, Dolby Atmos is an immersive sound you know, environment for listening and enjoying music. Um, stereo is two channels. If you have a 2.1, that 0.1 means you got a subwoofer. There's surround sound. A common version of surround sound is 5.1. So that's five speakers around you with a uh, subwoofer. There's 7.1. A lot of movie theaters are in 7.1. And then say something like Atmos is 7.1.4. That 0.4 is the big thing that separates Atmos from just a traditional, um, uh, a traditional surround sound environment. Those are four speakers above you, so it creates a sense of elevation. And the big thing from a under the hood standpoint is within the Dolby Atmos render. The Dolby Atmos render is a software application that uh, is connected to any of the DAWs available. So Pro Tools, Logic, Nuendo, things like that. And a lot, and actually now Logic has the Dolby Atmos render built in to Logic so you can produce music in Atmos within that DAW. But the Dolby Atmos render uses this technology called objects. And so you can assign this object to any audio source that you want, any instrument, any track, and it will be created, it will be generated into an object. And then you can place that object at extremely high quality anywhere in your room, anywhere in that space. So if I want to put something behind me, 35 degrees up, halfway in between, 100% fully on the ceiling or 100% fully on the ground, I can put it somewhere in the middle at angle, uh, at a degree of 36 or whatever in the back. And then I can send reverb and delays of that object to somewhere else in the room. I mean, the sky is the limit. The only limitation is your imagination. Uh, that is kind of the basis of Dolby Atmos is you have, in, in this case, in my room, I have 12 speakers. I have a 7.1.4 setup. You have your render. It, can, it will take in all of the traditional surround sound mixing that any DAW has and that what we've been doing for a while now and then also it bridges the gap with these objects and you can just create sequences and amazing um, moments of storytelling with your mixes uh, with objects. And then from there to export that, it's very easy. You record your song or your cue of music into the Dolby Atmos render. And then from there you can export it. And what's really neat, what we actually just did also for a feature length documentary is we did the score in Atmos and then they have what they call re-renders. And those re-renders will very quickly, with two clicks of a button, uh, fold down your Atmos mix into, into 5.1 or 7.1 or stereo or binarial. And then mentioning of the binarial mix is that is the headphone experience of an Atmos mix. And the binarial has been around for ages. That's been around for a long time. And that gives the um, the the spacing, it, it it folds down your Atmos mix of your 12 speakers in your room and gives you that sense of space within your headphones. Um, and that technology is getting really, really good. And uh, that's that's a fun part of it all. So that is the way you, with your AirPod ins right now, you would enjoy an, an Atmos mix is through that binarial version. But if you're in a room, like say in my, in my studio or in a movie theater or something like that, that would intelligently trigger like that playback system would play back the Atmos file. But if you're on Apple music hearing it, it will play the binarial mix. They call it spatial audio, but that mm -hmm. is going back and forth between the binarial mix. I would not be surprised um, if I missed some of the technical specifications of that, especially when it comes to, to the binarial, there's different codecs and so forth that are played with an Apple versus say title or Apple music pardon me, Amazon music, but um, that's, I don't know all of the specifics when it comes to that, but that is Dolby Atmos in a nutshell. And, you know, at the end of the day, man, it's like, it's, there's an, an incredible amount of dimension, like you had mentioned, and you can do some really neat things mm -hmm. uh, with Dolby Atmos and immersive audio. 
Now, is that the same file that plays back on the 7.1.4 as the binaural, or is that are these separate render files? They are files? different files. Great okay. question. Different files. So it is an ADM file, which is the main Atmos. And say if you have like a three-minute song, it's a huge file size. It's like a 1.2 gigabyte file, you know, uh -huh. when you're exporting something like that. And then that Dolby Atmos render will create the binaural mix. And that is a separate deliverable to say, you know, your music distributor, distro kit or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that binaural mix will be shipped off as well. And then you also have your stereo mix. So that's, it's an interesting game of like, okay, there's now like, say, if you just want to get this out into the world, there's three deliverables for my, for my gathering with all of this. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a stereo mix. You have to have the binaural mix and you have to have the ADM Atmos mix. And how does the stereo and the binaural mix compare in uh, file size? Great. Oh, okay. I have two part answer. Uh, yeah. File size, it's very similar because it's just the, uh, it's a matter of channels. So very similar. Um, I, I thought you were perhaps going to mention the difference between just the binaural mix and the stereo mix. And That's where I'm going so, next. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I've had some amazing discoveries with that. And there have been times where I've thrown on headphones and listened to the Atmos mix that sounds rocking in the room. And I'm like, oh, I don't like this in the binaural. I need to save as and just kind of do a strictly a binaural mix and make some adjustments to some levels. Um, low end for me has been challenging in the binaural world. Um, because from my understanding, the subchannel is eliminated from the binaural mm -hmm. mix. So you're in that game of trying to make things uh, feel full and round. And, you know, we all love our base and we're trying to find that balance of, you know, having everything, having your mix in the binaural format have low end. And then, you know, when I listen to the stereo, I'm like, oh man, this is like really beautifully compressed, but it's compressed and you don't have that sense of space and dimension and beautiful dynamics that the binaural mix will bring in the binaural mix is really i mean that that technology that folds down the 714 atmos mix into that realm is really good and it sounds i mean there are moments i'm like wow there's so much space and i really do feel like i'm in it in my headphones um you know the rack behind me has uh, a bunch of analog compressors and summing mixers and so forth. And we all have these great plugins in our computer to um, create our stereo mixes. And so the, the stereo bus has been mastered. It's been perfected over the past several decades. So we have this, this two bus magic that we all love. We all love that, that glue and compression and the saturation that those tools bring to stereo but man, it, is it interesting when I compare the two of the binary and the stereo? And I'd say half the, maybe a little over half the time. I these days I prefer the binary. Mm. And admittedly, I haven't done a lot of binary deliverables. It's mostly just been Atmos and just immersive work. Um, so I don't have years worth of comparisons at this at this time. But it's really interesting hearing the two. Um, I can send you a couple if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, that'd be fun to hear. Um, you know, for, through Apple Music, I, that's mostly where I've heard this some of the spatial music, and it is it's striking. You know, especially yeah. I've heard no, I've heard some mixes where I was a little bit yeah, yeah, okay. where like uh, it was a Weezer song. I think it was "Say It Ain't So." They added in spatial. I was like, "Where's the guitar solo? It's like kind of lost in here." Mm -hmm. it's it's not as present it was it really felt far away it's mm -hmm. other things sounded really cool in the mix um but all in all i'd have to say it was like the stereo sounded m more correct you know what i mean um because you're supposed to hear the guitar solo but it felt like it was almost like I, it, um, not so much that it was like far away it was almost like filtered out or something like almost like there was a a sheer white curtain in front of it. If that makes sense. I'm not surprised to hear that. I think that the, you know, Atmos and immersive audio, it's like the wild, wild west. We're out there just trying to, we're on the Oregon trail, trying to get to the freaking Pacific and it's a long journey and there's going to be bumps in the road and, or, you know, yeah. we're just, we're just leaving port and we're trying to find that tip of the iceberg. 
there's a lot to learn with it. And um, I welcome the these this conversation on that Weezer record right now because that's something that that mix engineer probably has heard and be like, oh, I'm going to do that a bit differently next mm -hmm. time. It's like a new language. It's a new domain to create and produce and mix. So there's um, there's going to be growing pains for sure. And I have definitely had those. Um, uh, I didn't really, re I didn't realize for the first like six months, the sub channel was gone in the binarial mixes. Mm -hmm. So when I would play back my Atmos mixes for clients um, in their rooms, yeah, the bass was like six dB higher than everything else. It's like, oh sh shit, like don't do that. Good lesson to learn. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's just, there's, there's great growing pains with it because it's a totally new domain. Dude, right. and it's so freaking fun creating that in that world like it's we just did that documentary i mentioned and it was so so fun mixing producing it in atmos and we were really able to help tell the story a bit better of the music it was a racing an auto car racing documentary so we <laughs> had all these car recordings that we got to morph into textures and pads and run them through tape machines and then bring them back in and like have those kind of swim around, um, you know, around you while you hear the orchestra and guitar and piano and everything else. That was just really neat to create those, that sense of, you know, emulation and the the vibe and the energy on the the racetrack. You know, right. when you're in, like in the pits of a of a of a car race, you hear cars all around you, and uh, mm -hmm. we were in like, but they're very distant. They could be a hundred yards away. But we were able to place those all around in the music score and just it just creates a sense of you're there it was so fun mm -hmm. you couldn't have done i mean you could do that in stereo but not to the literal physical experience that your ears and your brain would have in unless you were you know experiencing it truly in atmos yeah and i think i wonder how much of it is like that that song wasn't made from the ground up with Atmos in mind, I'm sure that changes the way you approach it quite a bit, where you mm -hmm. kind of, you know, you're going in that direction. Um, but I did hear another mix. Uh, it was Love Shack by the B-52s. And uh, that was really cool. Because yeah. what I didn't realize um, was how much partying is going on in that track. <laughs> like if you listen to it, there, th there must be like a, a whole track you know, throughout the entire track, there's just people kind of like, yeah, all right, hey, just kind of awesome. having fun. I had um, Matt Wallace and Bill Kennedy producers on the show, and they're big into uh, Atmos and immersive audio as well. And they they did Faith No More's album, and uh, and they had done the Love Shack uh, mix, and and that really blew me away. That was when I was kind of like, this is cool. This is something very exciting because that particular i didn't realize that that was such a component of that song i mean it makes perfect sense now but it that element of like just probably a, a at least one track running of just people partying in the background like that that's what they're vibe. going for that's that's the vibe they're going for i think it came through subconsciously maybe but to hear it it, it was just so much more fun yeah, really took it to a new level. That's awesome. There's some great plugins that are that have come out for mixing in immersive, and they are awesome. Um, there's two plugins by this company called uh, Sound Particles, and Sound Particles they have a plethora of, of of different types of plugins. I saw you playing with that on Instagram. Yeah, uh, brightness panner and energy panner are amazing. I mean, uh, just imagine. If you have a 7.1.4 setup and you have a an instrument playing, um, you can control the, the, say if you load in brightness panner, it will pan and create space determined by either the pitch of what we're hearing or the frequency range. And you can choose whichever one you want. And then you have like attack and release parameters and a threshold to control if you really want that audio source to be stochastic and very chaotic, you can do that if you really crank down that threshold, just like you would a compressor, like you're squashing a sound source. If you kind of, in this case, squash the audio uh, uh, audio source within this 
plugin, it will pan all around you like crazy, like a freaking hurricane. But if you just do very subtle threshold and just kiss the signal a little bit, it will be a very delicate, very gentle panning. And it will do, it will pan all around, you know, essentially for you, per what you are hearing, you know, within the music. So it's awesome to have that like with uh, just beautiful lush pads that are playing your chord progression. And if you control those parameters, the attack and release and the threshold, that pad can just be all around you. It can then be in front of you. And then boom, when the lower register hits, it can be sent all the way back and then come forward again. It's really amazing. I mean, extremely musical sounding plugins that like instantly bring creativity to like it, it just inspires new decisions it's mm. it's it's unreal it's awesome so you're moving certain frequency ranges around yeah you're sp so like yeah. the high end might be like kind of moving a little bit while exactly the mids and then you can different. set start and end points too so say if you just wanted to start in just traditional left and right just traditional stereo and then um, you set your endpoints to be, say, in the back and a little bit above you uh, up here. It's mm. you can control that just with a couple clicks of a button and then adjusting the attack right. release parameter. So like the attack and release is just like in a compressor, the attack is determining how fast that panning movement starts to happen per the threshold. And the release is, um, you know, how fast or slow that will uh, resolve and stop panning per the release parameter, just like a compressor works, right? And then you have your threshold. So if you really want a lot of crazy wild movement at like 16th or 32nd notes, crank that threshold. But if you are working on a very gentle singer songwriter or ambient piece of music or whatever it is, and it's just like you don't want anything distracting you and just want very gentle uh, movement and modulation, just again, like that, that threshold can just be a couple notches and it will mm. just gently do that for you. And it, the sense of space it creates is awesome. Hmm. Wow. Pretty awesome. So, yeah. Like, isn't that neat to just process yeah, yeah, that? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to. I mean, I'm thinking <laughs> about how you can use it in stereo too, by the way. Like, those oh, yeah? work in stereo okay, and any cool. output format. Yeah. Cause like something I like to do in like say like the verse of a song i like to maybe make it a little more mono you know mm -hmm. and then when the chorus comes in it widens out a little bit so that might be because new instruments come in or it might literally be that i'm suddenly panning things out a bit more mm -hmm. and i love that effect because it, it's just another way to sort of make your chorus or, or any like big part of your song kind of like blossom out mm -hmm. uh, to imagine having <laughs> like all these like 360 degrees to move Dude, stuff so cool there's this uh there's this one track that i just had a synth and it was kind of like a like a hoovery type synth with portamento or glide so you know it just does a like an octave thing with a fifth and just there was cool distortion on it ran through guitar amps and stuff like that so there's a lot of harmonics in this one synth that is dancing between um, one or two octaves. So you can imagine just how you can adjust that, you know, say the brightness where it starts on a lower note and then as it climbs the scale, it's it's brighter, you know, there's a higher frequency to it. And so it's that, that glide, that portamento is uh, determining where the panning goes in the room. Oh, wow. It's just, it's just so cool. Wow, so it's like bending away from you. Yeah, it's it's not only <laughs> bending musically, it's bending in right. your freaking immersive room. It's so neat. Wow. And that translates in a stereo system yeah. to, to some yeah. degree. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Does, does this make you wish everyone just had like, these seven point one point four oh, systems yeah. are I, I mean, <laughs> like, my, my like you can't Brian, listen to my song until you're in this spot. Yeah, my partner Brian and I. I mean, we. I mean, friends, family. We talk about this all the time. They ask that question. Like they're like Ross. You know, what happens if somebody doesn't have this tuned yeah. room that you have? I'm like, that's a very good question. And ninety nine point nine percent of the people don't have this room, um, but it will get there. And yes, I, I, I would encourage anybody to. You know, sit in a good spot in a movie theater or listen to it with um you know a great atmo setup but at the end of the day like however anyone can enjoy the music through headphones etc cetera, etc cetera, 
that's that's the way and I have to probably put a, a really big asterisk there with all of this is that none of this Atmos stuff matters if the music isn't you know good and heartfelt or meaningful or you know mm. it's all about just chords and songwriting and you know or if it's like angry nine inch nail style music like that just you got to get your emotion across that's the mm -hmm. first and foremost important thing um atmos is like a tool for that and it's an extension of the songwriting compositional production process so um that i probably even probably should have led with that um you know i don't <laughs> it's not about immersive that's not the priority line it's it's about music and then priority number two is the mix and right in an immersive and so forth so yeah the mix is the way you get to the emotional impact yeah and I, yeah. I think that's an important thing for people to always keep in mind i mean that's mostly what we're going for with music is emotional impact we're trying to create something set a mood or set a scene mm -hmm. and uh that that kind of philosophy has really helped me a lot with like these kind of silly biases i've had with music like whether it was like you can't quantize or you can't auto tune or or you have to quantize or all of these things it has to be perfectly in tune um using emotional impact as the guideline you know like oh well yeah maybe if i layer in some extra samples here to augment say like a drum sound if it feels more emotional then that's the answer but uh you know I think maybe there was, I don't know if it's like a punk rock ethos or something that is, you know, you, we all develop these things, right? Like we're like, no, I can't, it has to do with this. You got to record everything analog. It's got to be on tape and we can get kind of crazy and kind of forget why we might even have formed these little rules and ethoses that we have in the first place. It's, it's really the emotional impact. Yeah. And sometimes um you're surprised that maybe like something that you think is like the rule is really just a way of getting there man well said uh that's i i couldn't agree with you more now i have to imagine that this isn't all like uh for free like it must bring up new challenges and new problems along the way you mentioned something about like the sub and the binaural uh yeah mix gets kind of lost there yep um have there been other surprises that you found other challenges oh, yeah. new, oh, new yeah. problems <laughs> yeah there, there's been i mean there's been way more great days and awesome uh times producing and creating here in this room than there have been days of frustration or troubleshooting um but like for instance in the very beginning um you know with our equipment setup and just the build out um we had a hell of a time with dante and the Dante virtual controller and all that. I know that's a very reliable technology. Explain that, uh, Dante. Pardon? Can you explain what that is, Dante? Yeah, da Dante is. Um, gosh, I'm. This is not going to be the best like textbook definition of it, but it's a. Uh, it's a protocol that uses Ethernet. It's like the networking hub, and so a lot of the stuff is through Ethernet, mm -hmm. and so you're transferring a hundred. 28 channels of audio through one ethernet cable it's pretty amazing yeah. so that's kind of kind of the surface level definition of dante it's a networking hub and you can route everything um in a, in a very detailed very expert driven way like you can do a lot of neat stuff with it we had a lot of problems with dante in the beginning um, and i don't want anybody to be deterred i think it was just our experience with some of the equipment that we had but we ended up going with an aes uh, device to transfer the audio channels and um yeah that was just a big growing pain in the beginning was just getting everything set up and i had not ever heard of dante before atmos i hadn't i hadn't used it and it's kind of like learning a new language as i had mentioned like 20 minutes ago there's just new vocabulary words and audio that i had not ever um you know heard of before and then you're hit with all of that um, and then you're introducing, in my case, three new pieces of equipment to the studio. So we, at the end of the signal chain, we have a Chernov, um speaker processor. And the Chernov is probably one of the sickest, most amazing purchases, investments that we've ever done in our studio. It's an amazing unit. It takes up two rack spaces. It's essentially like another computer in the studio. And it does nano-accurate 
phase, time, EQ, filtering, all of that adjustment um, so, so well. It's just incredibly high tech and so good. Um, but that was another just learning curve. And like their ba the back end system, when I'm looking at the optimization and calibration looks like a freaking, oh, like Windows 95 window. Um, and, you know, I just had to learn all that in the in the very beginning. So there was those technical hurdles. But once we got through those, then you're off to the races. But there, I mean, there's been plenty of times where I've been a little overwhelmed, actually, where I am writing at the piano and I'm composing and I have to remind myself, it's all about the music first. Don't start, mm. you know, I, I don't need to start panning things around and doing crazy stuff so, so early in the process. Yeah, uh, but it's been a fun journey to learn, and 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 I'm so early in this phase too. Like I'm only a year and a half into it, of just like when I can start having the room and the environment help, um, you know, kind of come up with new melodic ideas. So, for instance, one thing that happened the other day was I had a great thunderstorm recording, and so I was able to put that above me. And I was able to put the thunder, you know, on kind of the plane level, that linear with my ear. Then, of course, send some stuff to the sub and I was able to spatialize all of that. And then the melody, just the way the melody was written, it kind of sounded like they were like raindrops coming down. So I was able to automate and pan that melody coming from the top speakers down, just Whoa. like you would hear like with, note by note um, with the, with the rain. And then I process that melody through like a, uh, a guitar pedal, the Spectral Tempest, and then created some additional like granular synthesis textures with it. And it was just, I mean, I don't remember all of like those thought processes that were happening, but it was totally just inspired by I'm bringing sound from the top to the bottom, just like this rainstorm. And wow. then as the rainstorm resolves, that's when everything kind of comes back full circle into just more of a traditional immersive sound and not like this <laughs> constant automation from top to bottom mm. that happened the other day and i just wouldn't ever done that in stereo like that just wouldn't in the way in the music i i loved it i loved how it turned out i loved the melody and the harmonies with it and i thought it was great so that mm. was a fun fun experience and i've had many of those um you know sessions down here doing that's that type of kind of crazy process. that's like the notes falling out of the sky <laughs> yeah and then and then like that happened for the first 45 seconds and then it kind of got to the main section of the song and then it just kind of it's just okay now we're in more of a traditional less experimental listening way but still in a, an immersive it just was mm. into the meat and potatoes of the song at that point right that's really cool. That's such an interesting right? application. It's there just, must be just so many yeah, things you that's can kinda, but dream to up. The question, though, to bring it back, like those light bulb moments happen, but sometimes it has been an issue for me thinking like that all the time. Mm -hmm. And I've it's been a, it's controlling all of the ideas that are flowing um, and just being like, okay, compartmentalizing the compositional process compartmentalizing the sound design and production process. And, you know, those go hand in hand all the time in stereo. Like if you're producing electronic music, the sound design of your lead synth is, is can inspire your melody just like that. Right. And so um, it's just, it's just, it's not over. It's, I've just had a journey and like not overwhelming myself. And I have to learn how to balance that of like, I don't, I have 12 speakers in the room, but I don't always need to go there immediately. Or maybe I do from the very first note. And then it, you know, I can get lucky with it kind of composing, helping me compose a song. So mm. it just depends, but that's, that's a struggle of finding that balance and when to hit that switch in my brain and so forth. Yeah. Well, that's, it's a really good point. I mean, I've had that with stereo and just having access to all these plugins and right? effects. Yeah. I mean, I've had drum beats, just it's a simple drum beat and I'm spending hours and hours panning and mixing and compressing and putting weird effects on and I don't have any music yet, Yeah, but I'm just fooling around trying things out. And once in a while that does lead to some sort of inspiration and you start moving forward because of that. 
But a lot of times it's tinkering and it's fooling around and it it doesn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. That can account for a lot of the unfinished projects on my computer that mm -hmm. were just likewise, you know, drum messing. <laughs> number 17 you know it's just <laughs> all kinds of nonsense i was doing but to keep in mind the composition the song the idea is so it's i guess it's always going to be the the big thing yeah i mean and you and i and your listeners and so many producers musicians around the world are just we all deal with this in different ways like it's yeah. we're always just trying to get that great chord progression great melody great lyrics great story being told and man creativity has a way of throwing curveballs at you and it also has a way of just letting it flow and it's great when it flows isn't it yeah it's a great it feeling is. it's just like going you just don't it's it's a high right yeah when you're in that moment when you're immersed in the moment <laughs> yeah no pun intended. right yeah. Oh, oh, and, you know, to your other point too, as you add to your setup, as you complicate things, you will inevitably run into more problems. Yeah. Uh, I noticed on your Instagram, you had a post with a four track, which I think I have the same four track as you actually, a Yamaha. Yeah, the Yamaha. Yeah, Yeah, like M MX4 or something like that. Um, but in playing with that, the immediacy of that, you know, is just so nice and sometimes so refreshing sometimes i go to a piano and play a couple notes or an acoustic guitar and i'm just like wow i didn't plug it in it doesn't need batteries there's no amp like it's it's just the thing that makes sound yeah. <laughs> it's it's complete in a in a weird way it's almost this crazy advanced technology that it doesn't need electric it doesn't need a computer it doesn't need like midi it doesn't need anything except for what it is it's it's kind of like um as you know, our technology keeps advancing things are becoming like more wireless more portable it's almost like we would wind up back to like an acoustic guitar <laughs> yep it's just kind right. of perfect and like the tape machines like that little clip or i have another one in the rack um a Tascam uh 122 mark 2 and that's mm. great i just have it running i just but stuff, I record all kinds of stuff through it and do a little bit of the the pitch modulation, which is fun. Just bring some character, maybe create a tape loop once in a while. Mm. And it's just that. And then like, if you do something like that and then you bring it into your immersive environment, imagine just a cute little beautiful eight bar piano theme, piano motif. And it's degraded and sounds like shit through your tape and it sounds freaking awesome. And then you bring it in here and then you bust it to your rear speakers. You bust it to your side speakers. You bust it to a Liquid Sonic 7 1.4 um, plate reverb or, uh, you know, room. Liquid Sonic's reverbs and Atmos are so good. And then you do a little bit of that sound particle brightness or energy pattern that I was telling you about. Like, oh my gosh, like you're... You're enveloped in lo-fi and it's so sick. Mm. So it just, that's where you just got to like, let those ideas flow. And like, I actually haven't, you know, done something like that in a minute. I'm like, oh wow. Like after this podcast, like I kind of want right. to record just a simple little eight bar thing from the upright into the tape and then spatialize the tape, see what happens. Mm. Are you finding that having all this, I guess, room does it allow you to have more things going on in your music or is it the kind of thing where the more you add, the less you can appreciate what's happening with it? Um, that is a, a great question. Um, I have found that, yeah, there's a lot more room for a lot of things, but it doesn't change my approach to the pr producing music. Um, just because I have the room doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, do another layer or something like that. I'm still kind of like that, that approach and that mindset is definitely the same. Cause you have to keep in mind your Atmos mix will be folded down into stereo into the binarial. So you got to fit all that shit into, you know, two small speakers, you know, for your headphones mm -hmm. that, that will wear. So that's something to keep in mind. What I, what has been fun is like, uh, say in some of the instances where I've done uh, a full production in stereo and then I've taken those stems and bringing it into the Atmos environment 
and you start throwing things around, you're creating it's that's really fun. Cause you're like, man, I have all this space to like let everything breathe and have a place. Mm -hmm. And then I find myself, oh, I have to go EQ that violin line again, or I have to, you know, subtract some frequencies from other things. Cause part of the beauty of stereo is you have kind of everything smashed together into a two bus and you get that beautiful glue and saturation from our compressors and so forth. And you have instruments that are masking other frequency content, but that's just part of the awesome, beautiful mess of like rock and roll and so many other things. But when you separate those instruments and then you put things all around you, you'd be like, oh, now I can very clearly hear this 4.2 kilohertz resonance that I definitely need to attenuate now that I'm in Atmos because mm. it's not being masked by something else and being, you know, squashed together from compression or something like that. So that's been a, a really cool thing to just observe like, Oh man, like why did my cello line have that? Or why did my OB six have this resonance that I didn't hear in the stereo version, but it's very audible in the Atmos version. Mm. Um, wow, so that's so been, you got to go in and just like re, -EQ, you know, EQ some things once in a while. Things get revealed that way. Exactly. Yeah. They, they're, they are becoming revealed because you know, you're unchaining, you're you're unlocking the chains of stereo that are left and right stagnant on the wall. And then you're just, you're now, you got the whole room to work with. Does it become difficult to have things almost too separate? You know, um, I've sometimes, heard, yeah, that's, yeah, been like, a, that's been a learning curve for sure. Yeah, like I take a three piece rock band and you start moving things around a little bit and then it might feel you know, that's one of the nice things that happens when you put something together exactly. in a stereo exactly. mix is that it's it's stuck together now. But yeah, I can imagine absolutely. if like this is there and that's there and it's like, I wonder and if that's it feels where, empty. And, and that's consider like the, it's all about like these little mental switches that I was inferring earlier is like, okay, this, this cue is like ambient and has like, you know, a lot of space like i can go full blown like utilize everything but then sometimes in that instance that you just laid out then atmos can just be used as like a tool and it's just a tool that you know the, the hammer or the screwdriver that's used just a little bit in the building process and mm -hmm. maybe everything is in that stereo realm but like you just put some of the overheads or you just put that maybe it's as simple as just busting that three piece to a liquid sonics reverb and it has a 0.75 second delay and it just creates a little bit of that room. Maybe that's all it is. And then literally like that's two minutes of work in an Atmos environment. And it's just in a small little tool, a little asset that's, you know, bringing a little bit of life to that. But yeah, there's a time and place, right? And I, I have this conversation with my uh, singer songwriter peers and colleagues, my rock uh, producer colleagues where not everything is going to be in, you know spaced out and thrown around all the speakers it's it's more of just a that uh, cherry on top you know just creating that little extra space because you do want that grit and that glue of everything else yeah yeah that's interesting because when you think of um it, coming out of two speakers everything is squeezed into that small area but if you were to see that band perform live they are spread out but you also have all the interaction with the room everything bouncing around in there i guess that it becomes important to really recreate that i'm sure with reverbs i guess just the room sounds not so much like an effect like or anything but just to inject that space into all all the space you have well and you said something just uh, just just there that you can you could simulate the room that the rock band is in you know mm. if the drums are behind the lead singer directly behind or whatever you could do that and you could pull it off mm. you know it's the, i remember one of the first atmos mixes i heard demo back in the day it was i think it was like a it wasn't ray charles it was i forget I, it was i think it was maybe ray charles and they had done an marvin gay maybe uh I think, maybe it was uh, marvin gay yeah what's was, going on was like kind of what came out like right at that maybe time. that's what it was yeah and like you and know that's another one that has the party feel like hey what's yeah, happening right? <laughs> you know? right. 
So yeah, that that's a good example of you really felt like you were in the room with that band and you were sitting in the middle of the room and you heard the drummer to the left or the right, whichever one it was, and the guitar player with his amp and um, his role in the band, he was on the other side and then you had Marvin in the middle and yeah, it was just, it was, that was really neat. That's really cool. Mm. Yeah, and I it's think fun. Was, to then, was demonstrating them side by side. With yeah. The same yeah. Fire. Right. Yeah. And we've had little hangouts like that down here in the studio where I'll put on some of that music and we'll just hang out here, you know, and drink some wine or something like that. And just have that, uh, the volume very low is more of just a, it's a, you know, background music for us. Mm-hmm. And boy, it's really neat. And you don't have to like talk over people either. It's like, you don't have to project your voice. Like you really feel like you're in the room with those guys and just hanging out with friends and family. It's pretty neat. Wow. That's fun. <laughs> it's exciting what's happening. It's it's a little scary, I got to admit, you know, just getting your head around two speakers and mixing things to sound decent is tough. And um, I guess that's just how it always is, though. As new things come out, technology is always advancing. Um, it's That's maybe we even said this before we started recording, but there's just always more to learn. There's always new frontier to explore and check out. Yeah. yeah. There is a new, there's always a new frontier to explore. And, you know, to, to your, to your thought of it, oh, it's, you know, it, it can be difficult enough to get stereo. I agree. Getting a good stereo mix, uh, you know, a lot of good time and work goes into that. And I just think, do whatever you want, you know, do whatever you want with, your music and if if someone is inspired to go down the immersive road heck yeah and i think you Mm. you might be really inspired and really surprised like holy shit like i'm thinking differently about how i'm producing this right now and that could unlock just a totally different like space in your brain maybe um that's Mm. been happening to me and then like taking your acoustic guitar and singing and running it through that Yamaha MT4X, whatever it is. And that has a time and place too. It's a, it's really also just like production in general, like forget Atmos right now, but just like if your piece of music calls for just very traditional 808 or 909 drums from a Roland drum machine, that's what it calls for. If it, if it's a timeless like Celine Dion record and it's going to have Korg Triton keyboards and guitar and strings and David Foster's producing it, that's going to have a time and place for that sound. And then if you have Skrillex, you know, doing something, um, producing a, an EDM or a pop record, you know, he's going to have a time and place for that musical approach too. So it really just, every piece of music is totally unique. It's all one of a kind, each and every piece of music. So just mm-hmm. like whatever, whatever that, whatever that music is calling you to do, you know, that's what we should try and do mm. and not get sworn right. and not get caught up in all of the, oh, I got to do this or I have to do that, or this is a new deliverable format, or I'm not going to get playlisted on Apple music. If I don't deliver in spatial, any of that nonsense, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like it just matters about like your musical journey and are you having fun with it? And do you push yourself? In the moments that you can push yourself and then um you know just make like good timeless music hopefully mm. well said well said great things to keep in mind because it is easy to sort of get caught up in just doing things because you can and right yeah that's not always the best way to go yeah i that that's another just great thought that you had it just that goes back to when and time and place when I start to work in Atmos or if I just focus on the composition or whatever it is, it just, it's always an if then situation. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. It sounds like a lot of fun. It is. It is <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah. With all of that said, I'm sitting here like a kid in a candy store like, man, I can't wait to like, you know, get back to what I was starting on this afternoon and just like, it's sounding really cool all around you. Hmm. cool well i can let you do that now um it's it's awesome talking to you man thanks so much for sharing all that and um it it does feel very exciting even just hearing about it and maybe one day i'll i'll 
play around, but I want to check out the sound particle stuff. That sounds really cool. Oh, so, really cool. Yeah, really cool plugins. Nice. nice. Yeah. Um, Brian, thank you for having me on your show. This has been a great time, and um, just keep doing what you're doing, teaching and giving back and producing music. And uh, you know, the world needs folks like you getting great, um, getting the getting the great word of good music out there. So Thanks. Keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. So where do you like to send people to check out your work? Um, yeah, if anyone's interested, you can just, um, you know, type in uh, my name, Ross Lara, into, you know, uh, app, Amazon Music or Apple, Spotify, any of that. Um, you can find some of my music that way. I have a little band called The Spacies, and that's with my buddy David. Um, he's a great singer. I can't take any credit for any of the singing on those songs. <laughs> he's wonderful. Um, and we have a lot of songs out. And we just released an album uh, last November called From Iceland. And per the initial part of our discussion, uh, we went to Iceland and froze our butts off and with four hours of daylight. And we wrote and produced a 10, 11 piece album. So that's, that's so out. Cool. And then uh, archipelago ent.com is our company site. And that gives a, a bigger overview of a lot of different things we've been part of um, over the years. So um, yeah, rossler.com or archipelago ent.com, the spaces, those are kind of the, the three main things. Nice. Well, I hope people listening will check it out. And again, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Music Production Podcast with my guest, Ross Lara. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps get the show out there for other people. And as I've been ending recent episodes with a little bit of wisdom, here's something I heard recently that reminds me of the way Ross approaches his music. Different is better than better. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Funk. Have a great day.